Kevin Lewis is a Berkman Fellow, and he's a PhD candidate in the Sociology Department at Harvard this year, and soon to um, have his, his PhD. Um, he also worked with a former Berkman Fellow named Jason Kaufman on um, some Facebook research and social network research previously. Uh, we're excited to have him today to talk about Make Choice in an Online Dating Site. So welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Omar. Appreciate it. Um, thank you all so much for coming. It's wonderful to see all of you. I'm thrilled the turnout is so great. Uh, the little worried, to be honest, that all of you really want to spend your Valentine's Day uh, learning about mate choice from a 28-year-old single guy. <laughs> um, so I'm thrilled to see you all. Uh, so one of the reasons that um, online dating caught my interest in the first place is that it's so rare to see a phenomenon, a social phenomenon, that changes so drastically in such a short period of time. Uh, it was really only 10 or 15 years ago that the practice was tremendously marginalized. I mean that socially in the sense that very few people participated in it in the first place. And relationships that began online basically counted for much less than 1% of all relationships out there. And also culturally, in that the practice was also highly stigmatized. The sense was, well, if you're resorting to online dating, there must be something going on in your uh, you know, face-to-face -face dating life. That's some uh, extent of desperation there. Uh, and really, it's, it's only in the past 10 or 15 years that this has changed drastically. We've all started to hear more and more anecdotes from friends, um, perhaps personal experiences online and relationships that are successful that began online. Uh, and I think the numbers themselves really uh, reveal how striking this change has been. So um, as recently as uh, 2005, uh, studies show that 37% of, of all basically single um, American internet users had tried an online dating site. Uh, and a recent study by Michael Rosenfeld um, shows that of all romantic partnerships that began between 2007 and 2009, actually 22% of heterosexual relationships began online, um, and 61% of same-sex couples met online as well, making online dating clearly the uh, most common way that same-sex same -sex couples meet today, and the third most common way that heterosexual couples meet behind uh, shared acquaintances and social venues such as bars and clubs. Um, we've also, of course, seen an accompanying uh, decline in the extent of stigma that's associated with the practice. People are much more comfortable admitting uh, that they online, you know, date online, that they met their partner online. And so uh, really, I think this transformation is fascinating, um, and the degree of impact online dating has makes it an empirical topic worthy of study in its own right. Um, what I'm going to talk about most of the time today, however, is uh, not the social prevalence, but actually the academic importance of online dating and what we as social scientists can learn uh, from data from these sites. So mate choice for decades has been a central topic of interest to scholars of inequality, and this is for two main reasons. First of all, uh, to the extent to which romantic pairing in a given society involves intimacy and trust, mate choice patterns can tell us a great deal about social closure or the extent to which individuals from different backgrounds accept each other as equals. Additionally, um, insofar as romantic pairing leads to offspring, we can also learn a great deal about intergenerational mobility, or the likelihood that the status differences of today will be passed along to the children of tomorrow. Now, to date, the overwhelming majority of research on mate choice and the sociological literature is focused on marriage patterns. Uh, this is due to the importance of the marriage relationship, and also the availability of accurate nationally representative data in the form of census records, uh, marriage records, survey data. Uh, and to anyone familiar with the literature on homophily, it will be no surprise that birds of a feather flock together in marriage, just as they do for virtually every other type of relationship. So with respect to marriage, we call this endogamy, the tendency for similar peop uh, people to marry within their social group, and homogamy, the tendency for people to marry someone similar in status. Uh, by and large, however, across a striking um, array of attributes, people tend to marry those who are similar to them. Now, prior work has not only described the landscape of marriage patterns that are out there, but identified three possible causes of the patterns we observe. First of all, we've long known that who we date or marry is constrained by who's available to date or marry in the first place. So it may be the case uh, that my perfect match, you know, my soulmate uh, lives in some beautiful vill village in the south of France, uh, spends her days drinking wine and reading philosophy as any soulmate of mine will surely be doing. Um, <laughs> given that the odds of me bumping into such a person are basically minuscule, it's much more likely I'll end up, uh, you know, dating someone, uh, another socially awkward grad student like myself from Harvard, right? Um, if I'm lucky, maybe someone from the law school. <laughs> <laughs> So the point is that, that relationships are constrained, first of all, by opportunity structures. And given that similar people tend to self-select into similar places, it's no surprise that this homogeneity is turning up in relationship patterns as well. Now, second of all, relationships are influenced by third-party interference. I mean this not just in the sense of external norms or sanctions, such as who your friends, your parents, your church, even your government want you to date or marry, uh, but also much more direct interference as well, given that friends tend to resemble one another and friends of friends tend to be sent out on dates with one another. Uh, it's again no surprise that homogeneity is turning up in relationship patterns. Finally, there's of course the individual preference for similarity or homophily proper. Now, marriage is obviously important for a number of individual and social outcomes, but insofar as we're learning about boundaries between groups, what's important is not so much who we actually date or marry, but who we want to date or marry, or as sociologists would say, subjective social distance as opposed to objective social distance. 
Uh, to date, however, due to limitations in available data and limitations inherent to the study of mate choice, it's actually been very difficult to disentangle the role of individual, individual preferences from these other two causes for the following three reasons. First of all, preferences constrain. Uh, as I just mentioned, um, who we date or marry is constrained by who's available in the first place. And you can meet your potential partner anywhere, uh, at a coffee shop, on the subway, at a Berkman luncheon talk, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but unless we have data on all these possible ties that didn't happen, it's impossible to say something meaningful about the actual ties uh, that did. And so given that um, complete data on opportunity structures, however, generally aren't available for romantic pairing, it's really been difficult to separate the role of individual preference from the constraints of opportunity. Second of all, preference is multidimensional. We all have uh, preferred characteristics and our ideal partner across a wide variety of attributes. But traditional marriage data sets only contain a handful of basic demographic information. Uh, consequently, multivariate modeling of relationship outcomes is actually surprisingly rare. And we don't have much of an idea whether an apparent preference for one attribute is actually a spurious consequence of preferences for another attribute with which the first is correlated. Finally, preference is directed. What I mean by this is a very basic and very consequential social fact with which many of us are painfully aware. Uh, and that's that one of the biggest constraints on who we date or marry is who's willing to date or marry us. The reason this is consequential is that very different underlying preferences can produce indistinguishable patterns in relationships. For example, let's take an example of a heterosexual ma mating with respect to educational attainment. So you have men and women who have a high school degree, an undergraduate degree, or a graduate degree. Now, one possibility is that the process directly parallels the pattern. In other words, everyone prefers similarity uh, with respect to edu educational attainment in their partner. And so, of course, homogeneity in uh, marriage patterns is what we observe. Now, another possibility is that everyone prefers to date or marry uh, someone with higher education. So we have in this case, if those at the top pair off, those at the middle pair off, and those at the bottom have no choice but to pair off as well, producing the identical pattern. Now, finally, there may be gender asymmetry with respect to preferences. In other words, it may be the case here uh, that women uh, very much want to date or marry someone with a similar level of education, but men don't care at all about the educational background of their spouse uh, because they are caring about some other attribute. In this case, it doesn't matter that the men don't care because they'll be forced to date or marry the only women who are willing to date or marry them. So the point is that indistinguishable patterns in relationships can be produced by very different underlying processes. But if we actually only have data on the relationship outcomes that emerge from this process, hypotheses about the dynamics that produce these outcomes can only be tested indirectly. So we have the situation then where a basic sociological puzzle has basically to date been unanswered. And that's what's the role of individual preferences in mate selection. Now, Recently, scholars have added another concern to literature on marriage, and that's that uh, marriage doesn't capture the same thing that it used to. Marriage patterns have uh, traditionally excluded and continue to exclude, in most states today, data on same-sex coupling, for instance. Um, and given rising rates of divorce, rising rates of cohabitation, and a rising average age of first marriage, uh, marriage patterns are also capturing a smaller and smaller proportion of heterosexual couples each year. In other words, marriage is an important outcome, but it's also only one possible outcome of a much longer relationship development process. And so while the majority of sociological research focuses on marriage, uh, in my dissertation, I shift attention to the exact opposite end of the mate choice spectrum and instead focus on the initial uh, searching and sorting processes whereby strangers consider each other as potential mates, express interest in some subset of this population but not others, uh, and find that this interest is or is not reciprocated. And to do this, uh, I use data from an online dating site. Um, in addition to its empirical prevalence, as I mentioned earlier, online dating, site, online dating data have a number of methodological advantages that speak directly to the limitations and the obstacles identified earlier. So first of all, we know the preference is constrained. And in an online dating site, we have complete data on the opportunity structure for interaction. In other words, we know exactly who has an account at any given time, and therefore not just who we message, but who we don't contact as well. Uh, second, preference is multidimensional. In an online dating site, people typically report a wide number of individual attributes about themselves, including not just demographic attributes like race or religion, uh, but also things like body type or um, you know, whether or not someone has pets, and basically data about which social sociologists don't usually um, have information. Finally, preference is directed. But on online dating sites, we can actually observe this directed interaction itself as it plays out in real time, whether one person contacts another and whether or how that person responds. So now we can actually get to the data. The, um, the data I'm using for my dissertation come from a popular online dating site called OkCupid, okay uh, with which many of you are probably familiar. Um, either personally or academically. <coughs> so it may or may not be the best dating site on Earth, but it's certainly uh, one of the larger ones. Uh, okay, Cupid. Yeah, it is free, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so you should all be members, right? No, doesn't that also differentiate compared to eHarmony and the ones that charge? Would certainly, you say certainly. The, yeah. So uh, an absolutely important yeah. feature of OkCupid, okay um, in addition to its size, it claims to have about several million active users, 
is that it's free, uh, unlike many pay, um, you know, for paid dating sites, subscription-based dating sites. So uh, that eliminates a substantial barrier to entry. On the other hand, you might say that people on this side might be more less serious about um, romantic relationships. Uh, thank you, Brian. Yeah, it tends to be younger, yeah, and I have um, descriptors on the, the demographics too, if you're interested in those later. But generally, people in their 20s and 30s, the median age is about 27. Uh, it also importantly advertises itself as a generalist dating site, right, as opposed to um, a specifically niche site catering to individuals from certain backgrounds or with certain interests. Uh, so now I thought it might be helpful before I go forward to give an example of what um, the actual raw data we're working with or what an online dating profile in OkCupid looks like. Um, so I just logged into the site and, and picked a profile at random uh, that I thought I'd show you guys. So Colin's not here today, is he? No. no. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so first, when you create a profile in OkCupid, the first thing you do is uh, you know select a username that others will find attractive and upload um, the most gorgeous possible uh, <laughs> attractive uh, picture of yourself. Um, you have the opportunity also to respond to a bunch of these open-ended uh, essay prompts where you describe yourself in response to, um, to various prompts. Now, the data I have are completely stripped of identifiers. I don't have uh, screen names. I don't have um, pictures, except for how many photos each user uploads. I certainly don't have the open-ended um, responses, except for how long profiles are. What I do have, however, um, are these closed-ended responses on the right-hand side of the profile, where people can indicate basic information about themselves by checking a number of boxes. Uh, oh, come on. <laughs> because now he shows up. <laughs> that was pretty creepy, right? <laughs> Um, so, importantly also, uh, you can search for other users on the site on the basis of these attributes. And so, for instance, I can tell the site that I'm looking for an athletic Hispanic uh, Pisces who drinks socially and owns a cat. Um, and when I find such a person, I have the opportunity to send him or her uh, an email using the site's internal um, messaging system, right? So what this creates then, by combining the data on profiles with the data on messaging, is basically um, a social network data set. So here's an example, for instance, of all messaging on the site among uh, users in the Northeast over a two-month period in late 2010, where the um, which the data are based. So the nodes are colored here according to gender, uh, and the size of the nodes is proportionate to the quantity of messages received. So visualizations can often be deceptive, but here we see an important just basic feature of online dating um, with which anyone who uses these sites will be familiar, and anyone who studies these sites will be familiar as well, and that's that um, most messaging behavior is, is men contacting women. Basically, gender norms in real life perhaps are reproduced online. It's not actually the case that there are many more women online. It's just that the size of those nodes are much, much larger. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. How are we supposed to see that in this graph? The, oh, the, the, that the, it's mostly men. So the, um, the size women. of the node is proportionate to the quantity of messages one Received. receives. So the uh, red dots are women. And Got so uh, their gender Received. balance is, ab is uh, roughly equal. Um, yeah, so the, it's an uh, algorithm that basically just minimizes the distance between nodes who are connected. And so what you end up seeing then is actually some geographic segmentation um, because people are still contacting one another. You're not necessarily interested in finding your soulmate uh, in Alaska if you live in Boston, right? So um, anyway, so it, the point is that uh, you can basically create this giant social network data set um, using these data. Now, uh, in the time remaining, I want to just run through some basic findings um, from this research. I'm going to focus um, basically for practical reasons on those who have uh, live in a zip code beginning with one zero or the area surrounding New York City. This has to do with the size of the population we're dealing with and computational limitations. Um, but many of the patterns I'll talk about today are absolutely robust across a number of different geographic regions. So what I want to begin with is exploring some gender hierarchies on the side and basically how men, male and female preferences uh, differ tremendously. This is something about which a lot of work is published but not often justified um, with the same type of data. So what we're going to see here is basically um, bars quantifying the, the attention that, that individuals from certain social backgrounds receive on the site, where uh, in comparison to a reference category, here white users, for instance, um, how many messages or the likelihood of receiving a message uh, someone is based on the background um, in, in here in terms of race. So what we see here is, is uh, pronounced finding that basically there's only one group of, of, of men on the site that are receiving the vast majority of messages, and that's white men. And so um, the differences are, are much less pronounced among minority groups. That's basically white males on the site who are receiving much of the attention from women. Uh, when we switch attention to females, the case is absolutely reversed in that it's not just one particular group that's receiving most of the attention, but a different group that's receiving the least amount of attention, uh, and that's black women on the dating site. We see that Indian women actually receive the most attention on the site, the most number of incoming messages, um, followed by Hispanic women and then white women, but uh, this difference is tremendously pronounced. Uh, it indicates basically the, the gender nature of this, uh, the racial status hierarchy we see online. Uh, something similar pops up to use another example um, when it has to do with educational attainment. So how likely are men uh, who have different levels of attainment to receive messages from any woman on the site? Uh, the story here is straightforward. That basically, the more education you have, 
the more attractive you are to female users of, of OkCupid. Now, here's what happens when we look at women. So insofar as men are interested in a female with higher education, uh, men are basically interested in a female who has a college education, no more and no less. So women with a master's degree or a higher degree, as well as women with a two-year college degree or a high school degree, are actually penalized vis-a-vis uh, -vis women with a, a bachelor's degree. Yeah. I'm controlling for everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so this is uh, we we chatted before, right? <laughs> Thanks, Darren. Absolutely. So um, you can't see them as well, but they're uh, these are 95% confidence intervals, um, which all do not overlap with zero. So um, we chatted beforehand a bit about the OKCupid blog, which many of us have read and find fascinating. Um, and because of the nature of the data, they can provide these relatively basic descriptives that are nonetheless fascinating. Um, what I'm doing here is actually running a statistical model that controls for a wide variety of other type, other possible reasons one user may be contacting another. So make sure that the differences I'm identifying are not, for instance, just an artifact of similarity based on age or any other attribute, for instance. So that's just an example, um, two examples of, of the gender nature of status hierarchies online and how different types of individuals are more or less likely to receive attention on the site. Um, what I want to do next is shift attention not to status hierarchies, um, but to homophily, the tendency uh, for similar people to message one another and to compare rates of, of matching based on similarity across different types of attributes. So with respect to education here, now previously the coefficients indicated basically one's likelihood of receiving a message uh, from anyone on the site. And here, these um, parameter estimates indicate the likelihood that two individuals from the same background will contact one another. So these are basically rates of homophily where these positive coefficients indicate the preference for similar similarity. And if we were to see a negative one, that would indicate a preference for dissimilarity. So with respect to educational background, we see the highest sorting basically at the top and the bottom uh, of the spectrum. Um, controlling for education, we also have some important matching effects based on income. Uh, not many people report income on the side. It's often private or unknown. Yeah. Yeah. Question about education. Sure. Could we explain the previous data by the fact there are a lot fewer PhD students, and therefore when PhD students contact each other, it shows much less traffic? So the, um, all these models control for basically the opportunity structure, and this has been a huge problem with past research, is that, for instance, uh, rates of, of white homophily, for instance, are always seem to be very pronounced because there are many more white people in the population. And so just based on chance, we'd expect more relationships. And so all my models control for that opportunity structure. Um, what is interesting, then, is even some of these smaller groups uh, do display pronounced degrees of homophily precisely because they're smaller groups and therefore more easy to, easier to differentiate themselves, I think. Yeah, oh, I was going to say, on the previous slide, I noticed that the uncertainty bars for the, the lower levels of education were actually larger, sure. which suggests that in the OKCupid data set, that the number of people with high levels of education is actually larger. Sure, and I, you absolutely find that I mean, when you look at descriptors mm -hmm. of the site and compare it to the broader population. Mm -hmm. So um, you're absolutely right also that there are fewer individuals in those, those groups, which is the same case with income, where very few people are reporting income and often saying their income is private. Right, and so uh, the models, again, take that into consideration. Um, and in these cases, we can't be too confident in, in those results because the uh, confidence interval is so large. We do see significant matching at the bottom, however, those who make uh, between zero to $30,000 a year. Um, much more people report their education, report their religion, for instance. So even though um, scholars have shown that the importance of religious similarity, for instance, has been declining over time, we still see substantial matching based on religion, especially among uh, uh, atheists, Catholics, and uh, Jewish users. Uh, and finally, of course, the um, pronounced importance of racial similarity to messaging behavior with the highest degrees of homophily among Indian users, followed by black users, Hispanic users, and uh, white users at the bottom. So yeah. this is indicative of matching? Is that more than just messaging? So, right, so match, uh, matching in messaging behavior, okay. right? Similar people who are likely to, to message one another. So this doesn't mean they have a successful date or anything like that? No, and that's absolutely one limitation of the data, right? As I'm saying what's going on online, I have no idea what happened after that if people met up in person. Um, which is why here all these, uh, these data have only to do with the first message that people send and the first response that they receive, um, because beyond that it's really difficult to infer what uh, longer interactions or the absence thereof mean. Um, if you and I suddenly stopped messaging one another, uh, we could have hit it off and moved interaction offline uh, otherwise, or alternatively the match could have just failed and we lost interest, right? So is the unit uh, a message and a response, or messages and responses? Both. So I look at uh, first contact, right, whether first that's contact. the first one you send or the first one someone responds, and that, those are the network ties. Uh, in this data set. Yeah. So it's directed ties. Directed ties. And you're absolutely. controlling for the number of total messages that a person sends? Um, no, not because I see uh, the extent to which someone sends messages to others is an uh, endogenous phenomenon, right? That's going to depend not just on my internal dispositions, but also who's available in the first place.
the question. This is what happens when I get another network scholar in the room. Um, <laughs> so what these data obscure actually is, so it, this is actually something that's remarkably rare in the first place, is to get a multivariate model of relationships in the first place, because usually all these data aren't available, and we just basically get some descriptive statistics on one or another dimension. Uh, what even these data obscure is the other types of matching that are going on on the society. So I'm going to give you an example of um, matching based on other non-demographic attributes about which we usually don't have data. So turns out, for instance, that when people who work in uh, clerical or administrative occupations, I kept the scale here the same, so you can literally compare the size of coefficients across. Um, if you work in clerical or administrative occupations, are very likely to seek one another out online, uh, as are people who smoke occasionally, uh, people who do not drink at all whatsoever, um, not even at the Berkman holiday party, uh, <laughs> people who use drugs occasionally, people who are Virgos. <laughs> um, this continues to baffle me. If anyone can explain to me why I see differential degrees of matching by uh, astrological sign, I'd be curious to hear it. Um, one of the faculty in our department thought perhaps people were misreading and, and thought it said virgins, and she was thrilled that they were fighting with one another. Um, as Mary Waters suggested, thanks, Mary. I, I told her it's not really possible with the structure of the site, but that was entertaining. Um, people who love cats, as well as people who uh, own dogs. Um, individuals who have multiple children, which of course is a marginal category on the side, speaking to the, the previous comment, uh, we find the same type of effect among individuals who say they like children but don't want them. Um, so again, minority categories on the side that are certainly seeking one another out. Uh, another important pet category, people who um, self-describe their body type, not just as uh, fit or athletic, but actually jacked. Um, <laughs> So our, people who spend a lot of the time at the gym, presumably, are, are very likely to, to message one another. Aaron, example of a jacked, Absolutely. right, OK. <laughs> uh, people who are especially short, um, people who have more than 10 photos on their profile, whether um, people are very attractive and showing off what they've got, and so beauty sorting, or people sorting on vanity, uh, perhaps. And um, people who have especially lengthy profiles, so those PhD students who, uh, instead of writing their dissertations, are pouring out their heart to strangers <laughs> online, um, are also messaging one another. So, this just gives a, a, some illustration of the um, multidimensional nature of, of mating uh, and mate choice that usually we don't have based on limitations in, in prior data. So what I want to do in one final step um, is show you a regularity that I found in the data that was very surprising to me, very surprising to others. Um, and this is comparing rates of initial messaging to rates of response on the side and disentangling these two dynamics. So what I'm going to show you in this model is the exact same thing we just saw previously, except I'm going to present two sets of coefficients. The, uh, the green coefficients are going to show you my tendency to message someone who's similar to me, where the positive coefficient will indicate a preference for similarity, the negative will indicate a preference for dissimilarity. Now, the yellow bars will indicate uh, who I'm likely to reply to, where, again, positive will indicate a preference for similarity in replying, and negative will indicate a preference for dissimilarity in replying. So when we just look at the matching coefficients, the situation is very similar to what we just observed, a high degree of, uh, of homophily and all these attributes. Here, however, is what we get when we look at the response behavior. So two features are immediately striking. Um, the first of all is that all the matching coefficients, sorry, the colors are difficult to see with the light, but um, the matching coefficients are largely positive, and the response coefficients are largely negative. This is, again, the, basically the, intersect, the interaction between each of these categories and, and reciprocity. Um, what this means, then, is people overwhelmingly prefer similarity in their initial messaging and overwhelmingly prefer dissimilarity in their responses. Uh, the second immediate thing we notice, of course, is that the standard errors are, are very large and the confidence interval is very large because we're dealing with so few ties there in the first place. But even if we restrict attention to the significant uh, coefficients, um, we see that basically some of the strongest social boundaries, uh, I would say, are also the most fragile, in that I may be very, very unlikely to contact someone from a different racial background than me, but in the unlikely event that such a person contacts me first, I'm actually more likely to reply uh, than to someone from the same racial background. So. Quick summary, um, the three types of findings I've demonstrated here today is, is first of all, that uh, we actually see some very pronounced gender hierarchies in the initial contacting behavior on the site, uh, not just with respect to um, racial background and education I focused on today, but also income, religion, um, and most other attributes that you look at. But usually, because we only have data on the outcome of the mate choice process, we actually can't observe these asymmetries uh, in preferences. Second of all, I showed that um, demographic attributes are absolutely important to mate selection, but so are non-demographic attributes. and so. Well, some people, uh, in response to the question of who are you, will provide a basic dem demographic description. Um, others might answer that question in terms of uh, what they like or what they do, or even how they look. And it turns out preferences for those types of attributes are equally consequential as preferences for demographic attributes. And finally, I showed that uh, initial contact behavior uh, varies systematically from response behavior. It turns out that some of the strongest uh, social boundaries are also the most fragile. Um, thank you.
Yeah, please. Very interesting. I was wondering if you could speak to the particular method of OK Cupid dating, which is you write questions in a sense that you ask other people to do, which is quite answer, which is quite uncommon to other sites. Sure. So does this create a filtering mechanism that already kind of maybe biases the start of the messaging process? Possibly, well, very likely, right? Um, it's unlikely to find anywhere else. Kind of. So it, those not familiar, um, OK Cupid has a distinct um, approach to matching, right? And that is that actually you know best what you're looking for, which um, may or may not be problematic as an assumption in the first place. And so what you do is, is go on the site and answer tons and tons of questions um, in three different ways. So say, here's a question, and we'll give it OK Cupid. Uh, here's my response, here's my ideal partner's response, and here's how much it matters, right? And so then the site has an algorithm that takes a bunch of answers to these questions, accumulates them, and pops back out a match percentage. Um, it then uses this this uh, this percentage to rank um, basically your, your search results and match you within the site. Um, now the trouble is we're talking about a, a dyadic similarity score between every possible user on the site, um, which in the data set my original data says about 1.8 million people. Um, bottom line is that's a lot of dyads, uh, and so I don't actually have the data on the the match percentages on a um, you know holistic level, and so. Um, I'm not as concerned about that, however, and so, like, except insofar as one's answers to those questions would, would bias, would you know, intersect with, with the answers to these other questions, which basically tone in, uh, hone in more on demographic you know, and, and descriptive characteristics of value rather than dyadic interpersonal compatibility. Right? But it's, it's one limitation of the data that I don't have um, you know, that kind of backdrop of the site itself. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the data set that you used was uh, primarily Manhattan, right? So the entire data set um, is for these, for the, uh, these analyses, yeah, right? Analysis. People in the um, New York City area. Did right. you find much variation? That being one of the most diverse areas in the country. Sure. Um, if you went to less diverse areas, did you see the data um, and uh, trends change su significantly? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. So the um, the latter two findings I presented about the importance of non-demographic characteristics is robust across regions, right? In some cases, it's not exactly the same categories. Maybe it's jacked people in New York and um, you know super skinny people elsewhere. Uh, but the general take home is the same. Um, and the reciprocity finding is also robust to a large number of, of regions. Um, racial hierarchies are also very common regardless of where you look. Uh, but some of the other dynamics absolutely vary tremendously. So in, in New York, it also turns out that um, notwithstanding the research on, on moral boundaries basically surrounding atheists, for instance, atheists and agnostics are like doing great on these sites. They're receiving tons of messages, men and women alike, um, and that's something that's certainly not robust across regions. And so I think um, some of those gendered hierarchies are absolutely localized, and that's an important uh, topic of future exploration, right, is to understand why these patterns vary in different regions. Yeah, Ryan. So uh, when you started the presentation, we were talking about, you know, like the other research that's been done, particularly focusing on the other end of the spectrum, you know, the like endpoint, you know, sure. marriage kind of thing. What I was wondering was whether in your research you saw any differences in particularly in people's um, match choices online versus uh, what other, other research has shown uh, outside of the online context. Sure, great question. Um, so in the first place, it's it's... The advantages of these data are, are, as I laid out, right, we actually hone in on preferences. The disadvantages um, is that I'm, I'm looking at, as I pointed out, the entirely different end of the, the matrix spectrum. So it's very likely that the things people care about in initial contacting are very different from what they care about in a marriage partner. Um, to me, this underscores the utility of my approach, actually, in that uh, we can probably expect that in these early screening and sorting stages, um, social boundaries are going to be most salient and personality factors play a minimal role because we haven't had a chance, chance to meet someone yet and so there really is no role of chemistry, right? Which many would say was the problem of online dating also, right? Um, you, someone looks great and then you get out on their first date and it's like, oh my goodness, uh, this is not necessarily what I expected. So, um, so that's one limitation. Uh, insofar as one does compare them though, um, you often find that basically rates of homophily are exaggerated in traditional data sets, again, because they don't control for opportunity structures or because they don't uh, control for other attributes that might be correlated. And um, the prior research has also found that, that basically whether you look at dating, cohabitation, or marriage patterns, you always see a pronounced degree of homogeneity. And so um, what that would suggest is that these patterns develop even earlier in the mate selection process. Um, and that's, a, again, uh, something that these data can provide insight into. So, sorry, with, with a follow-up uh, yeah. to that, you know, on OKCupid, not, not to reveal too much uh, uh, experience on the site. <laughs> um, a, a close friend of yours. Yeah, uh, uh, right. a, a good friend. Um, uh, Berkman stud. Uh, <laughs> people can express what they're looking for, mm -hmm. and so did you see any differences, uh, you know, like if someone says, oh, I'm looking for, you know, marriage on the site versus, oh, I'm looking for a one-night stand? Good question. So um, the, all these results are limited to people. So on the site, you can indicate that you're, you're there for any number of reasons, um, you know, a one-night stand, uh, dating relationship, long-distance pen pals. 
Um, these findings are limited to people who are looking for either um, long dis or sorry long term or short term dating at a minimum. You can choose any number of boxes, and so I was I was not I, what I can expect. These dynamics would vary according to intent, right? Um, and likewise, I focus only on people who self-identify as a single. You might expect that people who are married might behave a little bit differently on a dating site than um, others, and so I, I hone in on that that category. Yeah. I am sure that a lot of people in this room have read the article the other day in the New York Times about the MRS and the PhD, talking about education levels of men and women and how it was interesting one of your slides didn't refer to men ever preferring women with a lesser educational background. Sure. So I was wondering if you've encountered any data that, and it might be outside the scope of your research, but if you've encountered any data to corroborate that and to note that men are now preferring women who are more educated. Um, to some extent. So you're absolutely right that uh, I don't look at my preferences for someone else relative to my own position, right? I looked at these two general theories of, for instance, similarity and, and competition, who's receiving more messages overall. Um, interestingly, you find um, there's one effect where, where men with only a high school education on the site are going out of their way to avoid um, women with a high school education. And one might argue then, well, well, for this group in particular, there basically is no one else in the site that has you know, lower educational attainment than they do. Um, so the extent to which my findings speak to those dynamics are, are indirect. And one would have to look at basically the entire mixing matrix, we would call it, of, of interaction, where you see how people across every possible dimension here interact with every possible dimension here. Um, the advantage of my model is I'm also controlling for, for uh, basically popularity, the overall tendency to receive messages, as well as the overall pop tendency to send messages. Um, and if you include both those controls with the matrix, you have like an overdetermined model. Um, that's a more complex explanation than you asked for, but it's uh, there are technical reasons that um, that those findings actually might be distorted, also, and that this is actually not an unreasonable way to, to look at the picture. Yeah, it seems like there's so much data uh, for this site alone, and obviously all the other sites and geographic areas that you could slice and dice it forever. I hope um, so. <laughs> yeah, you almost. Yeah, you probably don't have time in one PhD, but I wonder if you were to advise someone who were just starting this sort of research, yeah. what other areas you think they could find some valuable information or uh, make uh, in interesting inferences. Appreciate it. So um, I think because the literature that's out there is again hasn't really been able to distinguish the role of these different factors, we really have under uh, underdeveloped understandings of these factors. And so what I presented here is a very broad, narrow geographically, but broad overview of different types of preferences. Um, I think the natural next step is to hone in on one or another dimension of mate choice and better understand the precise patterns that are going on with respect to education, for instance, with respect to religion. Um, understanding why these preferences turn up as they do, um, understanding uh, why we see the geographic variation we do. And uh, personally, my, I, I would love in a next step to, um, to get a grant to actually go out and interview actual dating site users uh, systematically. Um, and provide some interpretation and meaning to the findings I have and sit down with people and go you know, through them, through the behavior, you know, why did you contact this person, not this one? Um, what's going on through your mind? Uh, I think that, that missing qualitative component will add a great deal to interpreting some of the findings we have here. And I think that a more in-depth study would be the natural next step. Good question, yeah. Um, does this stuff actually correlate with dating records? I mean, can't you sort of look up in different countries who, uh, not, not dating records, marriage records, rather. Um, I mean, marriage records are legal documents and one degree public. So can you see, I mean, if you're talking about mating preference, can't you look at um, marriage records and see whether that correlates with dating site activity? One could. Um, so then you come back to the original, um, the original point, though, is that the, the marriage records are basically just looking at the outcome yeah. of this process. And so first of all, that's obscuring uh, you know, this directionality issue, for instance. Um, but it's also, as, as uh, you know, Ryan mentioned, focusing on, or discussed with Ryan, focusing on the opposite end of the, the spectrum. So you could compare um, the baseline patterns that you observe in each, uh, but it's difficult to know exactly what, what to make of those because it could be tapping into different things at different stages in the process or the methodological advantages or, or disadvantages of either. Um, but those data are out there, and the, that's the literature on marriage patterns in the in sociology literature is, is extremely well developed and, and nuanced, um, looking at patterns over time, looking at uh, geographic variation across countries, um, and so it's uh, the really developed literature. But I'm trying to kind of go beyond that in one way. Yeah. I, I, are there dating sites that are that are trying to track outcomes? I mean, do, do, do they do they they must want to collect data on outcomes? So, so long as the outcomes are good, right? Well, I mean, well, they want <laughs> yeah. To, to so it's the only ones they want to share. Yes. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, um, Match and Harmony, I know, have both uh, conducted surveys and in collaboration with an external agency to to show that each respectively their dating site is the best and produces the most happy marriages and that kind of thing, okay. um, as each does claim to. And so, <laughs> the um the findings I begin with are. are Something I would put a little more credibility in because they're conducted by a sociologist and actually went out and surveyed a national representative to sample of the population. Not that the matching harmony results are biased, but um, you're right that they're absolutely interested in, in you know, marking their sites and showing that they produce positive, happy mass um, matches. 
the survey data, though, do show that, that you know, matches who met online um, aren't really in any systematic way, I, I don't believe, different from those who met offline, which is um, heartening to, to skeptics, I guess. But, uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, I was wondering, I know there have been some OK Cupid blog posts sort of tracking, like, what questions and stuff, like, make people most successful to say they met each other online. And I was just wondering if that's just data that they couldn't, you couldn't get in terms of what yeah. people who said that they, I met my significant other OK Cupid, and that's why I'm taking my profile down. I do have those data, actually. So you're right, there's, there's vast quantities of information out there that they have that um, you know, we didn't acquire right. But uh, you know, one of those um, is when you close your account, basically, you can indicate to the site. It says, OK, why are you leaving us? And you can say, well, you advertise too much, or I, I've met my soulmate uh, online. So um, I do have those data. I've not actually looked at them yet, because you're dealing with um, so few cases. And the trouble with that is, um, even if you, you indicate that I'm leaving because I, I you know, found a relationship I'm happy with, uh, you don't actually indicate who that person is. I thought, I thought you indi you indicate who it is. Yeah, you can. Okay. If you do, they didn't yeah, give us that, um, okay. unfortunately. Yeah. So okay. I would have to uh, take the potentially risky step of inferring backwards based on like the last person they were in touch with, which may or may not actually okay. be that That's person, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, maybe I'll have to go back to them for the extra bit um, of, of data. Yeah. Yeah, right. uh, great talk, Kevin. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for this. Um, I'm interested in hearing more about the reciprocity result. I, sure. I found that interesting. And did you control for gender in that? Absolutely. And how much of that? So, is there a theory behind that? What's, what's going sure. on? Sure. Great question. Um, so the those all the models I showed have basically the exact same set of controls. I'm controlling for gender. I'm controlling for the, the baseline tendency to reciprocate messages in the first place. Um, that said, it absolutely leaves a lot to interpretation, and that's um, one effect in particular that I think the qualitative data would be helpful for. Um, one could speculate, for instance, that uh, people might be more likely to give a polite rejection to someone who's, who's crossing a racial boundary in the first place because you're not you know, worried across, uh, of not coming across as racist or that kind of thing. Um, I think that type of explanation is, is not so likely given that there's basically no cost of, of not replying to a message. Um, and I, in fact, there's some risk of uh, sending a polite, a polite rejection and the other person misinterpreting it as, as interest. As, um, some dating coach over here is sick. <laughs> right? So I mean, rule number one you learn when you when you join on on dating side is that, that no response means no interest, and then you get some awkward situations happening when in fact you you do oh well this you know Aaron was he's so cute and so nice. he took the time to craft this you know nice beautiful message to me I'm just not interested in, in dating an academic though so I'll at least send him a you know no thanks um, and for Aaron over there it's, well in some cases actually write back and be like. Well, what I do wrong, <laughs> you know? Um, and so this is not exactly an exchange I want to be in. So I don't think that explanation is, is as possible. And um, what I think is going on is actually what we were discussing at the, before the talk was um, having to do with the basic nature of, of cognition and, and uh, prejudice, is that I, I've not looked at these numbers, but I would expect to see that um, this racial in-group preference is equally pronounced in uh, profile views as, as well as messages, and that people, when they go out and look on the side, basically aren't even con considering individuals of certain race or background, right? But if this person goes out of their way to send me a message, all of a sudden they're, they're you know, pushing their way onto this mental map. And I might give them an entirely different type of consideration and actually look at their profile um, in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise. And so I think that's really what's going on here, is, is that the, um, the, the initial stereotype and then prejudice is just kind of a, a blanket approach. Um, but once someone you know, pops up on your map, uh, you have an entirely different mental framework with which you uh, view them. Yeah. So to follow up with that, I was just thinking, uh, I wondered if these kind of patterns correlate with implicit assumption tests, where you have people who do word associations very quickly and figure things come out. Right. But I wanted to take another step and ask about ethics. You might not mm. feel sort of qualified to ask it, but uh, <laughs> or address the question. But OK, Cupid received some controversy, and it was probably a marketing ploy when they sent people who had not been active on the site for a while, saying. We have now tweaked things so that you're going to see you're attractive, and we're going to tweak it so you see other attractive people. Okay. So if people, and so you say, well, that's kind of silly. But what happens if yeah. they did something that one race, knowing that people mm -hmm. at least like the message, other people of a similar race, or if you're anyone, anyone that doesn't like that, most people don't like the message African American women apparently. Sure. You know, and hence they get filtered out. Do you mm -hmm. have anything to say about the use of your sort of work? Yeah. In, the filtering mechanisms that get sure. built into these software. So I'm going to try and be as uh, descriptive and objective as possible here um, as a social scientist. And that's, uh, I, I really don't know what's, what's going on in that, in that black box, right? And it could be any number of things, to be honest, um, some of which would be more or less problematic for this type of research. Uh, I've heard similar things like that about OKCupid in particular. Um, that's certainly not to say they're the only site that does it. They just might be um, more open about it. Uh, one also hears frequently, um, or more or less frequently, about uh, 
uh, users who want OkCupid are basically contact them at some point and say, look, uh, based on patterns of, of you know, contact and who's looking at your profile, we've identified you as someone who's really attractive compared to other site users, and now we're going to upgrade your matches um, and give you more attractive uh, you know, search results as well. Um, Honestly, I'm skeptical whether they're actually doing anything at all. Right, some people say it's just a marketing ploy. Yeah, and so, um, I mean, that would require a, a lot of effort that I'm not sure what, what exactly that, um, that buys them, right? To, to fiddle with the algorithm, to, to upgrade your, your search results like that. And so um, I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case, uh, but I have absolutely no idea what, what else is going on. And, and again, that could be more or less problematic for my findings insofar as, as their behind-the-scenes uh, alterations coincide with, with the data I'm looking at. Um, what can you do? <laughs> so, great question, yeah. Another possible explanation that I'm thinking of with regards to um, cross-racial contact sure. is that you don't have the data on the preferences and, and hobbies and all that kind of stuff. So it could be that someone is a different race than me, but they have a really strong reason to break that norm and contact me sure. because we have something really obscure in common, like scuba, scuba diving and... Right, matching based on some other non-observable. Yeah, um, it could be the case, but one would have to explain why that would turn up only in the replying and not the initial messaging, right? What what caused someone to, to actually you know take the step, the additional step to go and look at the profile and identify that actual pre that um, extra compatibility and uh, covariate already. Right, yeah. and so it also you know there's a lot in the models that, yeah. that may pick up on that kind of thing. But one would need to explain why that turns up only in replying and not in the initial message, which I think is the is the puzzle. Um, I'm quite convinced it's not an artifact, which some people are concerned with also. It's, it's you know, uh, quite robust and there's lots of controls in the models, but I think the interpretation is still a little bit open. Yeah. I, have, I have an alternate theory that might be interesting. I don't know if it's worth exploring. It's the same thing about why, because I think that's the kind of weirdest finding in some ways, sure. and the most interesting from the level of it contradicts all this homophily stuff that right. we, as social scientists, and, you know, assume is going on everywhere right. all the time. Um, and that is that the internet historically is kind of good at helping people solve these like second order status problems huh. so like what i mean by that is that it, i might not do something in public not because i don't want to do it or i'm necessarily uncomfortable with it myself but because i know kevin's watching huh. kevin as my friend is going to see it right. and the internet's a really nice safe space in the sense that kevin my friend might not see it right. so in that sense i wonder if that's part of what's going on that people are actually able to reveal the fact that they're curious or intrigued by the fact that someone who's not like them has contacted them. Huh. Um, I mean, it, it goes along, I think it's not, it's compatible with the explanation you sure, gave. Sure, sure, uh, a little more nuanced. It goes into like why the response, yeah, it's like part of why the response, anyway, I don't know, it's... There's it, some interesting data there on bisexuality, the degree to which women label themselves as bisexuality. Oh, That's yeah, yeah, I've the, seen that on the OkCupid okay, blog. Like performance post. results, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Kind of performance, even huh. if they don't follow through with that particular preference, yeah. or have that preference in genuine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, um, if I had another thing to do in the next step, would be to, so all these models are, of course, heterosexual pairing, right, um, for a number of reasons. Uh, the foremost among which is we really don't know how uh, same-sex or bisexual pairing works because our data come from, from marriage for the most part. Right, right, um, yeah. But I would absolutely want to compare patterns among these different groups, which I think would be illuminating in lots of different really ways. Um, yeah. Yeah. Want to, sure. <laughs> well, one of the things, many things that we can use to is the percent match number. Right. In terms of like, you know, it sort of gives you evaluation. I'm just wondering how much of an impact do you think that has in terms of like whether you respond to matches just by itself, like whether other things or in terms of how people see it almost seems like that's kind of like the new proximity, just your percent match or? Sure. I'm confident it's playing a, a tremendous role in, in, you know, filtering out this vast population <laughs> down to the, you know, the, the small portion of people you might actually be compatible with or the side things you're compatible with. Um, again, however, I, I would be, I don't think that that, that narrowing uh, over, would, would affect my results to a great degree. I think that is kind of an independent dimension. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the, the fascinating things about this topic in the first place is, is you suggest that maybe, maybe this is replacing geographic distance. Um, I think it is uh, in that way and, and, and in other ways that, that basically bring individual preferences to the fore. Um, a slide, if you don't mind, I, I love this show. Is um, some other favorite thing to talk about is uh, Facebook, not um, online dating. But here's a snapshot of um, my Facebook, my own Facebook friendship network, for instance. And it's ridiculously rare to see this type of, of segmentation in any network, right? We have basically here, you know, my uh, college friends, my high school friends, my grad school friends, and Courier House, <laughs> where I'm. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm a tutor. Yeah, thanks, guys. <laughs> um, and so traditionally, right, where would we be finding our, our romantic partners? Um, absolutely in one of these social foci. Not that one. Uh, but <laughs> um, people lose their jobs for that. But <laughs> so we're meeting our partners at educational settings. Um, there's also, you know, yoga buddies, uh, bartenders at Westside. <laughs> um, you know, other people. These social venues that constrain interaction, right? Uh, and if it's not a social venue, we're probably meeting people who are, who are basically two degrees off this map, a friend of a friend. And online dating is, is totally shattering um, that traditional way that people meet one another. But what you're seeing instead is a more direct mediation between uh, individual preferences and the outcomes, where rather than going into the grocery store and looking for a certain type of soap and being limited by what's available there, uh, we go on Amazon.com instead, where the, where the you know, selection is much broader, um, and we can actually you know, get the product we want uh, insofar as it's, it's available on the site, right? But, yeah, I, I think it's a fascinating aspect of online dating for that reason. Have you looked at the possibility of the opposite hypothesis, which is that online dating, particularly in the niches, uh, reflects friends of friends? In other words, the same people that you might be dating on, let's say, J-Date, uh -huh. might be the same people you're friends with on Facebook uh, or uh, in business relationships with on LinkedIn. Sure. I think... Um, one might suspect so, especially in, in these, these uh, you know, smaller groups of people and in kind of niche categories. Mm -hmm. But um, in just anecdotes uh, you know, from, from friends and peers, I think actually it's occasionally you bump up into someone online that you might you know, recognize in real life and just kind of steer clear um, <laughs> of, of, of such a person. Uh, and occasionally also you get stories of, of, of two people meeting one another online who actually very plausibly would have met otherwise, right? Because you know, it turns out they, uh, you know, they're, they are you know, two degrees removed in certain ways. They actually just missed each other at this conference. Um, they're actually both regulars at some coffee shop and just happened to you know, never have struck up a conversation yet. Um, but I think in general, uh, you are you know, generally meeting people that, that you wouldn't have, have otherwise. And I think those instances are more like the, um, it really is, is amazing how constrained interaction is and how many people we don't meet just because of our day-to-day -day trajectories and where we're walking and who we're interacting with. I think online dating just really transforms that. Um, sorry, I skipped over you a second ago. Yes, I was going to say, you know, okay, huge, of course, except everybody. You know, how do you think the results there might differ from, you know, a niche site like JDate that sure. that or or from a site like eHarmony that is known to reject, you know, potential customers whose responses are too far outside the mainstream? Right. Um, great question. I think um, a couple different cases there. So there's, there's some sites like. Um, eHarmony, who I guess might reject people, I'm not as familiar with that case. Or uh, I think perhaps of uh, like attractive, uh, attractivepeople.com or something where you get, you have to apply and if you're attractive enough they let you in. <laughs> Beautiful, beautifulpeople.com. Um, and so that's one type of, of, of selection. Um, the other problem though is one could, especially insofar as I'm, I'm trying to infer social boundaries from interaction on these sites, one would say, look, those who draw the strongest boundaries are just going elsewhere into a site specifically for them. If I really want a Jewish partner, I'm not going to be on OKCupid, I'm going to be on JDate. Right, so um, to that end, these findings could also be biased towards those who are, who are more generally open. Uh, that said, um, one other advantage of these sites is precisely that you can search, you know, for these these um, this described or searchable characteristics in a way you can't elsewhere. And so, um, insofar as such a niche site doesn't exist, or maybe it does exist, but there's also you know it needs to have a sizable population. Um, going on OkCupid is very helpful for me because if I'm really interested in, in dating that Virgo or that uh, you know excessive uh, alcoholic or someone who doesn't do drugs or whatever, um, it's very easy to find them. And uh, you know, online dating sites once they reach a kind of a, a critical threshold, it's it's worth me jumping in and saying, look, they have enough people there um, that even as someone who draws these strong boundaries, this site will let me hone in on exactly that population. And so I think those two tendencies might counterbalance one another uh, in terms of the, the strength of the boundaries I see drawn. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was just wondering. Like, one of the, the pieces of advice I've seen, like in terms of using OkCupid, is to respond to people because it tracks how often you respond, and if you uh, don't uh -huh. respond enough, it'll give you like a red dot above your name saying red the dot, person right? yeah. responds rarely. And so if people is like, well, why should I bother? It's not worth my effort oh. to respond to email that person because yeah. they rarely respond. I would say the opposite, though. I think um, in again chatting with folks, you, you sometimes find that so right. Uh, OkCupid will give you an indication how often this person replies. They I think basically if you like, it's like a, you know frequently, which is probably the same as like always. It doesn't want to say make people seem desperate, right? And so it's like <laughs> often, sometimes, or basically like selectively. And um, you might say, oh, okay, this person has a red dot. They barely ever reply. Why should they even bother? But it's like, oh, this person has a red dot, right? There, um, there's something going on here, and this person's selected, more discerning. I think um, it's also in some ways more more attractive, and it makes that person seem more uh, more desirable. Hmm. I don't know. Any uh, flash up some personal experience here? No. Conquest. <laughs> <laughs>
book, you know, the um, screen another, that a person puts up. To, it's another boundary that they've created. Of, sure. Of exclusivity. Hard to get. Absolutely. What do you think about the feature, for example, in JDate, where they'll the inbox will like do animate until you actually read the message? Oh, I wasn't. So it just kind of bugs you and is annoying until you actually yeah. look at that. Um, <laughs> great strategy. If I were a user of the site, I'm not sure if that get irritating at, at some point. But um, I think again that goes back to these, these baseline you know gender norms of interaction that you see on, on these sites. That basically, as a male, uh, you're the one who's, who's initiating you know contact all the time, just as, as men often do in real life in, um, in heterosexual pairing. And, and as a female on the site, mostly you just have to sit there and watch the messages come pouring in your inbox. And in fact, that's the most tedious thing as a female is just you know plow through all these. And oh my God, there's you know, 72 new messages. Half of them are just like, hey, what's up? Um, <laughs> the, face, you know, uh, the other half are, are for whatever reason, uh, you know, is totally unattractive or undesirable in one form or another. And so I think that really, you know, colors the day-to-day -day experience of these sites for men um, versus women. Uh, another aspect of, of that, though, that I, that I enjoy is I get into arguments with um, female single friends all the time. It's like, oh, guys don't like being approached. They don't like women who are too confident. Um, and uh, we should just let them, you know, come to us and say it's total bunk. And in fact, um, on the site, you see... Uh, coinciding with those baseline patterns of interaction, I took the slide off. Sorry, um, the uh, the response rate among men is also much much higher. And so, as a, as a woman reaching out to a male, you are over twice as likely to get a reply as a, as a male sending a, a message to a woman. And so I was like, look, this is you know fantastic for you. And then I don't know, those guys come to me. <laughs> so, yeah. Sorry, thank you. Um, See, so yeah, I wanted to go back to that really fascinating uh, delta between uh, the inbound and outbound responses with regards to race. Uh -huh. And um, right Eli Pariser gives this really fascinating TED talk on what he calls the filter bubble, okay. um, where he argues that algorithmic filtering mechanisms uh, can predetermine and often skew the behaviors of users. Sure. So could this be a, 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 an indicator not of social biases, but perhaps algorithmic ones? Uh, like are people coming from getting... where exactly? So the algorithm being the matching percentage, or just well, who OKCupid okay so, I mean, chose to show you? If if there's this much responsive interest from people getting messaged outside of their uh, race, right? Is is OKCupid okay perhaps not emphasizing that enough in its uh, recommendations? So it's not basically it's not presenting you with these matches. So. What I would wonder then is, is where are those cross-race cross, cross race messages coming from in the first place then, right? Like we know they're very rare, uh, but once they do happen, we see this other pattern. And so right. um, for those that do happen, I'm, I'm not sure if that, that response is, ca is compatible with your um, suggestion. Like there, there are people there who are crossing this boundary in the first place, even though it's unlikely. And I'd be curious to know who exactly those people are and why. I see. Um, okay. And also, I mean, there's um, data that we don't have uh, in that data set, but, but um, indicating how people basically found each other. So when I first clicked on your profile, you know, did I see it is because you contacted me first? Did I did it pop up in like a, a match recommendation? Did it pop up in search results? And so I think those types of data might also provide more insight into where exactly these ties are coming from. Uh, right, but I'm not sure we have the, the, the nuance there in, in the data to explore it. That's one possibility. And again, speaks to the black box of, of other things that might be going on behind the scenes there. And related, I mean, are the rates of cross-racial messaging really that much lower? Um, yeah, I mean, so the, the coefficients here are all in terms of log odds of, of one user contacting another one, right? And so, I mean, they're, they're very pronounced when you, for those who are uh, familiar with speaking log odds, <laughs> um, hopefully not many of us. Uh, these, these baseline rates of communication, like these are, these are in some cases, very pronounced um, differences, right? And all, almost all of them statistically significant. Um, it's difficult to pare those down into meaningful uh, descriptives that are more, basically, if I, I give a descriptive stat that's very intuitive, it also doesn't control for a bunch of other things that I should be controlling for. And so um, what I can say is it absolutely is a pronounced division. Um, and this is what people have been finding for decades in the, in the marriage literature as well, is that you know, intermarriage has increased in, in recent years, um, but racial boundaries to marriage are, are still absolutely the strongest, just as they are in virtually all their types of um, relationship. So you're, contr you're controlling for income, education, other factors when you... In this model, yeah, everything's all, all together. Um, in the previous one where I, where I give a more nuanced look at um, one category versus another, this has a bunch of controls and just education, and another one with just race, mm -hmm. uh, but this multidimensional model is, is everything in one. It's part of the reason I only focused on New York is that um, the approach I use, because of the complex interdependencies in this network data set, uh, basically requires a tremendous amount of time and resources. And some of these model results took like over a week to run with 60 gigs of RAM on Harvard Super computers or whatever. And so um, there's, I faced severe computational limitations there just to do what I wanted to do uh, in the proper way of, of doing it. So both a strength and a weakness, I think. Yeah. I'm curious what the, like, 
strongest affinity for in interracial responses is? is it like oh. Asian women respond to white men more frequent, most frequently. I'm just curious sure. if you found any like startling results there. I've not looked at those, which gets to the exact same um, issue we had earlier with the, the specific rates of um, <laughs> messaging between people with different educational backgrounds. It's basically that would be entail filling out the entire mixing matrix right. and say men of this type are interested in contacting women of this type, um, which doesn't allow you to control for some things, but is also kind of inherently interesting. Uh, there's um, some scholars at UMass Amherst uh, who have a, a comparable data set from OkCupid, and they're, um, they're looking at some of these exact types of, of uh, you know, intergroup um, preferences, which is fascinating work. Um, the trouble is, and, and begin because we usually don't have these data, I think um, people struggle to come up with a thorough explanation. If you have just five racial groups, that's you know, 25 basically data points here, you need to explain. Um, and it, it turns out these, these um, you know, findings are not really amenable to just straightforward explanations about men prefer this or women prefer this. And to actually come up with a, with a nuanced, accurate explanation for why each of these patterns occurs as it does is um, something that's been elusive, I think, for some time. Yeah. Apart from uh, education and income and race, uh, what if you just looked for like the keywords that were the most indicative of matches, like they like the Red Sox or they like skiing or something? Is there like a particular uh, in the profile? You mean the open-ended yeah, uh, like, responses? Or like the Rolling Stones or another more specific Right, I think that'd be fascinating. And again, no. Could you just like rank keyword matches in terms of responses or? One could. Okay, Cupid could. Um, but we didn't. Uh, we didn't get those data right. Nothing from the open-ended. Um, responses, but it'd be fascinating, right, to see a similar plot of, of like keywords and what people. Um, I'm sure there are things out there that you know, just uh, for whatever reason are off the charts in terms of predicting compatibility. Um, although, again, I'd be uh, you have to be careful of those types of things because when you throw enough data points at anything, you're going to get some results just by chance, also, which is um, you know some limitation of, of other fascinating research that has provided these broad overviews. But also, it's important to identify uh, what's actually a signal and what's just noise. But I think that'd be fascinating. Yeah. So I, my other my last question is sort of speculative. It's uh, you know, I think there's one way to read these, which is the way that you've presented it here, in the sense that you're looking at this as you know we have this amazing transcript of this behavior that's been going on for mm -hmm. a long, long time, and now we can finally understand what the general mechanisms are behind the scenes. You know, what's inside the black box right. of dating, right? I think there's another way to read it, which is that you know, the expansion of online communication and more historically situated, right? So we've got this period in the United States, late 20th century, where we have increasing indicators of social isolation, sure. expansion of information, communica information, digital online communication right. tools, right? And that this is telling us something about the way that people like seek information and build social ties under those conditions. Right. And I'm just curious, I mean, it's, I'm just curious what you think of that or if you have ideas about yeah. how you would think about it in those terms. Good question. So um, at Piss Things Today, is online dating being somewhat of a, a natural experiment type thing where yeah. it presents these ideal structural conditions for isolating the importance of one factor we usually haven't been able to isolate. So what natural response is, well, to what extent is the interface itself or these unique uh, social historical conditions uh, changing, um, changing preferences themselves and altering what we see. Um, historical effects, I think, would be compatible with my interpretation is that, you know, people might care about different things today, but we're still interested in, in what they care about. Um, insofar as people, the interface itself is influencing behaviors is more problematic and some of the questions we've, we've talked about today already touch on that. Um, at the end of the day though, I think it's, it's just doing both. I think, um, you know, online dating is providing, is making preferences more important. Uh, and so that allows us to better understand them and that's also consequential for the relationships uh, themselves. Um, but you're right, though. I mean, you, why, why is online dating on the rise in the first place? Well, people have online social networks all over the place that they're increasingly uh, familiar with and comfortable with. Um, we have these structural changes in society that I mentioned, again, um, you know, decline, rising rates of divorce, um, the, uh, increasing age of first marriage. And so I think a lot of factors are, are you know, kind of channeling people into this technology. Um, but I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon, yeah. um, especially as the stigma declines. I mean, as more and more people are using it and finding matches and people are just tired of being single, um, more and more people are going online, which further decreases the stigma and so on mm -hmm. uh, until everyone's going to be only using online dating and never leaving their homes. <laughs> <laughs> that people are becoming really picky and unsatisfied because of their use of online dating websites? I've seen other research to that effect. Um, not that it's in particular, yeah, article, but uh, more picky because of online dating. Well, fascinating too, right? And insofar as these... Um, these categories online, like it reified in the first place, and maybe because something is giving us this option to fill out 
oh, it wants to know, you know, what I think of like dogs. Like, okay, maybe this is like important. Or um, we were cons <laughs> we're therefore considering attributes that we might not have cared about right, yeah. um, otherwise. Which again emphasizes kind of the um, the fact that meeting someone online is just inverse to to in real life, basically, right? Where real life, um, you have this immediate sense of chemistry of interpersonal attraction, uh, but we're not at all walking around with signs in our forehead about our income and our education and much as our personality. Whereas online, you have all these, you know, tick in the box and your own you know, description of yourself. Then you get out in real life, and, and there may be fantastic chemistry, or it might be just dead, right? And so you're approaching um, this, you know, romantic selection from entirely different angles. Uh, but interestingly, with with high rates of success, either either way, right? And so um, I think that's another proof area for future research: is um, what exactly is going on there? How relationships begin online? They're different from those that don't. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if at the end of the day, they're very comparable. Uh, right. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The more things change, the more they stay the same. Right. <laughs> also mm -hmm. I mean, well, one thing that I find interesting is that you've, you've been talking about how looking at online data. I'm, I'm a big proponent, a big fan of online data, you know, sure. <laughs> so that's my dissertation too. You? But um, the, looking at online data allows allows us to understand patterns of matching and mm -hmm. dating. But at the same time, you just said that the way we pick people online is very different than the way we pick people offline. Sure. So I was wondering to what extent can we learn from one about the other, like you can learn about the how the process getting to the end result in different right. ways from online and offline, but at the same time it might not be representative. Like I can imagine people who are more willing to look outside the box or looking online because they don't find multiple partners in their everyday lives. Sure. So some of this has to do with how the process itself online is different. Others have to do with what how generalizable is this um, this population, right? Who exactly is online? Um, actually, recent research has shown that. Uh, once you focus in on the people actually like at risk of online dating, in other words, those who are single, those with internet access, um, there's actually uh, right? <laughs> um, the two populations are statistically indistinguishable with respect to a wide variety of, of demographics, um, so it, which is lends confidence in generalizing. Uh, but yeah, the process itself is very different. It doesn't you know one doesn't necessarily at all speak uh, speak to the other. But um, yeah, I think it does it have this advantage to focus in on, on this point of interest. I mean, I think it's intriguing that you find a high degree of homophily uh, by race, for example, in here, given, in religion, given that you already have specialized dating sites for yeah, that are largely based around those categories. Yeah. But it's interesting, though, is, is what that the meaning embedded in that side as well, right? So maybe you actually really care about someone who's similar to, to me with respect to X, but you really want to be dating someone who's going to say that they're, you know, all they care about is that. So maybe I really want a Jewish partner, but actually to take that step to go on J-Date or, um, you know, I, we all run attractive partner, right? But like to actually you know, apply for beautifulpeople.com. Um, so yeah, it's going to give me someone attractive, but someone who's like totally vain, right? That's, uh, that's BS. Well, it's a self-selection thing where it's like yeah, the sure. people who think that's important go elsewhere and the people who are willing to <coughs> fiddle around at the margins, right? Certainly, but that's what I'm saying is that there may be cases where we, you know, care very much about these things, but to actually go take the step to and join it, right. a niche site for yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Cool. Like, uh, I really like Apple, but I'm not going to join Cupertino, like, it's, it's <laughs> a uh, niche site for lovers of Apple products. Oh, God, I um, didn't know that existed. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what's out there and what people afford you as a scholar of online dating. Awesome. <laughs> uh, dating sites for truckers, um, dating sites for beautiful people. The uh, Date Harvard Square is pretty much, you know, it's where, um, so, so I, as I understand it, uh, men with Harvard degrees, you know, sign up for free, and then women of any background uh, can pay oh for the privilege of going online and dating a Harvard-educated male. And it's like, uh, wow. <laughs> it's, uh, at the end of the day, these might actually be perfect matches for one matches for one another, but um, for let all the wrong reasons. Let them go off. Yeah. That's right. Let's <laughs> purge the rest of our pool. Thousand polls. flowers <laughs> bloom. <laughs> right. I shouldn't say things like that, but. Do they have to have a degree or just be a the men, yeah, Harvard, Harvard degree, yeah. I think, right? Bill Gates was an internet. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. You know. HarvardDropouts.com. Yeah. Harvard that's right. That's a new, yeah. Good <laughs> <Your> idea. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Yeah.